everyone and welcome to the fourth ever Marketing Meter webinar. Uh, today we've got the absolute pleasure of uh, spending some time with Dave Gerthart, DG to his friends, uh, the CMO of Privy and uh, always in a hoodie, very importantly. Uh, Dave, for me, uh, represents one of the most exciting practitioners in the marketing industry today. Uh, he's not just an academic who thinks a lot about marketing he's there in the trenches doing it every day which is sincerely impressive uh, dave spent his time working in several of boston's most well-known well-known companies including uh, constant contact hubspot but for me at least dave came into view during his time at drift uh, during these times when everyone asked me who was the best marketing uh, team in the world, generally speaking, I would respond with Drift, uh, and that's uh, I've learned a lot from them. Since December 2019, uh, Dave's been the CMO of Privy, a company focusing on helping e-commerce brands increase their growth through conversion and email marketing tools. And he's a busy dude because in his spare time, he's also a guest lecturer at Harvard Business School and maintains his Patreon following the A-list, which you can be part of too. There's two things I really come to admire about Dave. The first is that he's a dedicated family man. And uh, if you follow him on Instagram, you'll get to see that. But perhaps the thing that's uh, most impressive is his willingness to share with the community. At this point, he could probably just sneeze on LinkedIn and get a thousand likes. Uh, but I know that I've personally gained a lot from Dave's work, so I'm grateful for him. Uh, before we get going, I just want to say, Thank you to uh, the sponsors of the Marketing Meetup, all of whom have been unbelievable in supporting this group, even during these tough times. I won't go into depth here because uh, there's a link in the email I've sent before and afterwards. Um, <laughs> but if there's a group of people I want to uh, just thank, I want to say thank you to Pitch, Content Cal, Fiverr, Redgate, Cambridge Martin College, Lido, Brand, Further, Third Light, Bravo and Human. If there's one thing I could do to ask of everyone that attends this, this webinar afterwards, it would be just to drop them a message afterwards, uh, just to say thank you for their contributions to our community, uh, because without them, we, uh, we wouldn't be able to carry on doing what we're doing. Uh, the last thing to say is today is a QA, and uh, a which means that you can use the Q&A feature, which is down below. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of questions written down old school style on the sheet of paper. But uh, if you guys wanna ask any questions, then now is the time. Uh, there is also an upvote functionality there. So you can also, if you see a question you like, if you thumb, give it a thumbs up, then uh, we'll ask those ones first. So all that said, I wanna say welcome DG and thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me, Joe. I appreciate all the nice things that you said about me. It's the best part about having an introduction is you just get to sit there and, and <laughs> listen. So um, I appreciate that. I, I love marketing and it's what I love talking about and doing. So I'm happy to be able to be here and, and hang out and do it. I'm grateful for you taking the time. I know you're a busy man. So uh, I think it's wicked that you've even said yes in the first place. You're one of the first people I tried to get in touch with when um, this webinar program started. So the fact you said yes was not only amazing, but a great confidence boost to sort of get in touch with an awful lot of other people too. So that was awesome. So I just want to ask the first question, which very simply is, how are you? How are you doing? How are you adjusting to this new life? Yeah, I mean, I'm, we're, we're doing good. Um, everybody in, in my family is, is healthy and we're safe. And so um, from that perspective, we're good. Uh, I, I, it's tough to it's tough to really say any anything else other than that right now. I think, you know, we're lucky to be in, you know, to to have jobs, to have a, a safe place to to live and go, and and to just be in a position where like my job is in is in marketing. Like I'm the furthest thing from the front lines, and so I think, um, you know, we're we're in a we're in a lucky position, and I think we've just made the shift to work from home, which luckily enough for us is a it's, it's normal for our industry. I have lots of friends that can't work from home. Um, and so I just, I think we're just feeling lucky to be honest. For sure. And have you like, I mean, you, you sort of alluded to it there that we are pretty used to working from home, but have you learned anything during this time that you probably didn't expect or, or whatever? Yeah. That my team is really good at what they do and I should get the <laughs> hell out of their way and shut up because, uh, I mean, we've been, 
putting up some amazing numbers and, and the, the, the marketing team at Privy has just been cranking out some amazing stuff. And it's been really interesting because like I'm just super type A person who even though I try to delegate a lot of stuff, I just like I got to know about everything and I got to be in the weeds on everything. And it's, it's a gift and a curse. And this has really forced me to like, you know, I can't, my, my wife and I both work, we're home with the kids. It's like impossible to really actually get work done. And so my working time has just shifted to like either doing calls like this or doing calls, one-on-one calls with my team. And it's just been amazing to just see how they've taken off and, and taken on, responsibility and leadership and like I think this is going to make us such a better team it already has when we actually do get back in the office together and so we've really just shifted to like you know trim down on a lot of meetings and instead of doing like a big long marketing meeting we talk every day at 9 30 we do a zoom call on Mondays that zoom call is focused on like metrics recap from like how we're doing month to date and so the person who runs demand gen on, on the team he'll go through all the all the numbers month to date where we're at how we're doing what we're working on this week then we'll look at the editorial calendar for the next week and then every other day of the week uh, monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday we just do a daily stand up hey what are you doing how are you doing just five minutes to see each other and, and that's been great uh and then on top of that the other change has just been to like up the frequency of one-on-ones with the people on my team. So we're just doing them twice a week just to check in, which is really o- only possible because I don't have a big team right now. We, there's there's, there's um, only five people. So um, spend mo- most of my day talking to the team. And other than that, I'm, I'm home, you know, with the kids hanging out. Nice. That's awesome. I mean, so that's really interesting because from the outside, at least, you do seem to be really involved in implementation. You know, you're, you're in the trenches almost day to day. But of course, a traditional CMO role is probably one of management, is one of sitting back and sort of being more strategically based. Are you still doing elements of tactical implementation day to day or is that down to the team now? Yeah, I mean, so so part of it is the reason why I joined Privy, right? Which is like, I think if you know anything about me, I love marketing, like I love doing the marketing. And so, you know, I'm, I don't think that, at least in where what I want in life right now is I'm, I don't think I'm fit to be the... CMO with a hundred person marketing team and spending my whole day doing budget meetings and planning meetings and spreadsheets and process. And this person's unhappy. This person wants a raise like that, that that's, that's too much. I, I like doing the marketing. And so, you know, part of the reason why I went to Privy was because I could basically do, do 50%, you know, marketing and then 50% setting the marketing strategy and leading the team. And, and it's the perfect mix. Um, I would say I'm not in the weeds. I'm not, I'm not like writing emails. I'm not writing headlines, but I basically think my job is almost like um, chief editor. Like I'm the editor of all of our marketing. And that's, that means like, I, I want to know what the headline of the, of that article is. I want to know what the subject line of the email is, but I'm not writing it. And like, so I've been very involved in, in, in that type of stuff, kind of more, more so like the overall strategy, like what are we going to do? And the, the, all, you know, most of the creative stuff, but, but the team is executing on everything day to day. And they're saying like, no crazy man, we don't need to do that. Cause we already got these three other things that we're doing that you suggested last week. And so like, for me, it, it's just a really good fit for, for what I think personally I can bring to the table, which is like energy and enthusiasm and creative ideas and matched up with a team who like wants to go out and execute and can push back. And it's, it's really been so much fun to, to be able to do that again. Nice. Are you 100% that boss that walks into, into the office or onto Slack in the morning and says, I've had an idea? <laughs> yeah, I mean, most of the time, to be honest with you, most of the time it happens before I've walked into the office and like... <laughs> It, you know, the joke is that like, I'll get to my desk and when we would actually go in the office, I get to my desk and I've already been talking to the team for an hour this morning, or, <laughs> you know, I've already sent five emails uh, with ideas and, you know, that's, that's like the job that I signed up for. And, and I set that expectation with the team up front though. It's like, just because I might be sending you five emails at nine o'clock at night doesn't mean that I expect you to answer. Yeah. Uh, but I don't want to have to like hold back when I'm sharing something with you. Cause it just kind of ruins the process. Like, Oh, I had to get this idea. I'll, I'll send it tomorrow. Like, I think people are grown up enough to be able to handle that. And I just set that expectation up front that like, Hey, just because I'm always sharing this stuff mm-hmm. doesn't mean a, that you have to respond in real time and B, it doesn't mean that you have to, 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 to actually do it. I want you to be able to like, 
comb through the list of things and say, eh, that's not important right now. Oh shoot. That is actually a really good idea. We should stop and, and, and change what we're doing right now. I guess that goes a little bit back to down to that trust element that you sort of spoke about at the beginning there. And, and maybe, I guess you might have more, even more trust at this point, uh, having had this experience perhaps. Yeah, I, I do. Honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm just like having to learn, um, to just shut up more and, and, and like, like why can't I why can't I remember that the team is super smart and I don't need to do all this and like <laughs> that's been my daily reminder um to just get out of the way and, and shut up for sure no that's fair that's fair so uh many of the marketing meetup audience are based in the UK and uh, one of the terms that you use a lot is playbook now um I'm pretty sure that probably originates from American football um but you probably just call it football over there. But like, could you explain the concept of uh, your what a playbook is and how you approach it and how you tend to apply your playbooks in, in sort of the marketing sphere? Yeah, I think it's just a name, right? I think it's probably probably a comparison would be like, you could also call it a recipe. Yeah. Um, you know, you could all call it a formula. I think it's, it's any of that thing. So you're asking about like my playbook specifically? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'd love to know what's in it. Well, I think so. So I can tell you, I can definitely tell you what's in mine. But I, I think <laughs> that to me, the best marketers actually have many playbooks and mm -hmm. can go and like adapt that playbook to the new company or new product that they're at. And so, mm -hmm. like, there's definitely things that I think were were in my playbook right from my past company drift but just because i have a new job doesn't mean i can take everything that worked there and apply it into privy and it's going to work and i'm saying this because i see a lot of marketers doing this like just blindly copying a playbook that either your old company or somebody's company has done and assuming it's going to work so number one is like i think it's almost like being an athlete the best athletes are are versatile right like they can do but be successful in a bunch of different sports and i think the same is true in, in marketing. Um, as far as my playbook goes, I think like it always kind of starts with putting storytelling at the center of what we're trying to do as a company. Mm -hmm. And so that means like sharing who, who you are, like who, who are you, the actual people inside of the company that are going to be doing mark, do the marketing. Like how can you get your face out there and introduce yourself to that community so people can know, like, and trust you. And then with that usually comes like a heavy content component. So like blog, video, podcast, social, my, my bias has always been to like build some type of content thing around the brand. So you can start to build an audience before you actually have something to, to sell. And so like, I just believe so much in the, the, the power of like creating content and, and telling that story. So like when, when we went to Privy, the, the first thing that we did there was start a podcast, not because we thought we'd be able to grow a huge podcast, but because like, I think that a podcast is basically like a Trojan horse for like capturing all the content you need from your brand. And that, that's a lesson that I, that I learned at Drift working with David Cancel. Like we started by doing a podcast together where I just interviewed him, like what was going on in the business at a time when we had no content. And that was a way to just get a ton of content out. And, um, that's really the approach that I've taken anywhere. And I, and I would take that anywhere that I go. Let's say that I go start an e-commerce brand tomorrow. First thing I'm going to do is like make a video about why me, why did I start this brand? What are we doing? What are we learning as you're going? And so like everything that I've done has, has kind of had that, um, I guess, formula in there somewhere. Nice. That's awesome. And that, you've actually sort of jumped ahead to my next question, which was what's been added, what's been taken away and what's stay consistent across the jobs. And in particular, the consistency is what I'm really important uh, interested in because like you've gone from like one really uh, high profile job where you've been super central to the growth of drift over the course of time, you know, and a part of an amazing team as well. But now you've sort of got the eyes on you as well. So, I mean, like, is there some immutable laws of marketing, which just like you carry close to your heart and, and use to inform the tactics? So for example, you spoke about podcasting, which is probably, uh, a tactic within content marketing, which then falls into marketing as a, a general thing. So at a very fundamental level, what are those sort of marketing fundamentals that you've brought into to Privy? Mm, this is good. Okay. So I think one of them for me is copywriting. Like mm -hmm. copywriting is, is everything to me as a marketer. And I actually think 
it's not just a marketing skill. Like if you can write great copy, you can, you know, cold email somebody for, for sales. You could write that passive aggressive email to your <laughs> landlord to get 50% of your rent back. Right. You could write that, write that message to your kid's school. Like I think copywriting is like the ability to communicate clearly and sell through words. And so if you can't do that as a marketer, um, nothing else matters. And, and also I think I love copywriting because copywriting is rooted in like the most important principles of marketing, which is human psychology, understanding like what makes people tick, how to persuade someone, you know, understanding about emotions and wants and desires. And so like, if you can't write great copy, everything else is going to be hard. You could be the smartest product marketing tech, technical product marketing person in the world. But if you can't write great copy, no one's going to be able to clearly understand what you're doing. Um, and so for me, it's always got to be like great, great website copy, great email copy, like, you know, uh, something that hooks you right away in, in all of your content. And, and with that copywriting comes like really sweating headlines. Like it's 2020, like you have to accept the fact that everyone is just headline reading, right? Think about what's happening with coronavirus right now. Like mm -hmm. nobody's actually reading the fucking New York times 5,000 word articles. Right. They're just, we're all, we're all like, I do it too. We're all on Twitter scanning headlines right and so you have to you have to know that you have to know that as a marketer like okay how are you going to use that to your advantage then and it's not just using it to your advantage but how, how are you going to how are you going to cut through the noise right if somebody else has a thousand different headlines going on what's going to be the thing that you that you do to cut through the noise and so in addition to copywriting which is part of that the other thing for me has always been trying to be like what is that what is that thing that's going to get people in um, something that I, that I stole from, from Gary V, who I think is incredible at this is he calls it underpriced attention. Mm -hmm. And what that means is like, where are the opportunities for you as a brand where you can compete? And so when, when, when I went to Privy, like you have to look at the landscape of what other people are doing in the market. And so we saw a bunch of other companies that had good email lists, they had good blogs, but nobody in our in our space at least from a competitive standpoint really had a podcast and so we said hey we want to own e-commerce marketing as a brand mm -hmm. let's go start the e-commerce marketing show and have that be our hook and i think that there's underpriced attention for starting that show and the response has been amazing so far and so like so, that that to me is like you have to be able to like see the playing field and see what the opportunities are like just because everybody in your industry has a blog doesn't mean that you should go start one and like you have to, in the early days, look for the opportunities where you can have a unique advantage to go out and win. And, and for us, I thought that's like, oh, there's a huge opportunity to build a podcast here. Um, and I think this is going to be something that, that anchors everything else for us. So um, I'm trying to give you more because there's a lot. Copywriting is one. Finding underpriced attention is another. Um, I think just like being authentic in all of your marketing is, like, is another thing for, for me that's really important. Because I think like you have to understand the environment that you're marketing in, which is it's 2020. Nobody wants to be sold to. Nobody wants to deal with marketing. Nobody wants to click on ads. And so like the way you can cut through that is by being authentic, right? It's like when you go to a restaurant and you ask a waiter, like, what's good here? And they say to you, everything's good. You're like, bullshit. <laughs> yeah. That's not true, right? <laughs> yeah. you, like we, we want it. Like I want the waiter who's going to be like, eh, what are you in the mood for? Oh, th just trust me. Like I know pizza is pretty regular, but you got to have the pizza here. It's ridiculous. Like yeah. that's what we want. We want real authentic experiences. And so I think like even if you're selling enterprise or from, from selling like hoodies online all the way to enterprise software, I think you have to find a way to like, weave authenticity and tell that real story inside of your marketing those are probably like the, the core principles that i think then you can figure out like okay because of that what does that mean from a strategy standpoint that's awesome i love that and you know so your background your first job was actually in was it in press or, or something to have in, in, in yeah it was in it was in pr okay so like, a, did you did an you internship sorry did you learn the ropes there or was it through reading as well that you sort of picked up on your copywriting and, and your best copywriting tips? I don't know. I think like looking back, looking back, I've always, I've always been, been good at writing, um, not writing at like a perfect grammar, you know, English degree level, but like I've always been able to clearly articulate what I like. I've always been that person that my mom or my now wife or my friend has been like, 
can, can you write that email? Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> what would you write to, to my dad? Yeah. And I think that I, I just never realized that that was a business, that was a business skill. And now I'm like, you idiot, that's everything. Um, and so I think like what, what happened for me is I had that PR internship and I, I wasn't really interested in business after graduating college. I just, I wasn't really interested in, I don't know, I just, you just needed to find a job. And it was at that PR internship. It was the only place that would pay me at the time. It was ten dollars an hour. Um, I realized that oh my god, I was good at this because of my writing. Like I was, you know, getting reporters. Like I was hooking them and pitching them and getting. And so, like, what what changed for me is I I saw this skill that I didn't think was that important, which is just oh, it's just writing. I'm now using it to like be successful in my job and get promoted and make more money. And I was like, oh wait, there might be something here. And then I, I kind of turned the PR job into a marketing job and it just became something that, you know, I, I naturally took a liking to and, and kind of got like addicted to. And while I was at Constant Contact, um, I just always wanted to like, I always wanted to start my own blog or have my own, you know, newsletter. Cause once I got into marketing, I started to see all these people that like, oh, they, they're marketers, but they also have like their own blog. How cool is that? Like, I'd always just like, I always want to have my own radio show or a blog or whatever. And that, that led me ultimately to starting this podcast that I did in Boston called Tech in Boston, where I'd go and interview local um, entrepreneurs. And that was the thing that really changed for me, like, because that taught me how to do marketing. Like that was, I was like a 25 year old kid working at a 1500 person company. I wasn't really like touching anything important, mm -hmm. but because I started my own thing, like I had to build the website. I had to figure out how to do podcasting. I had to cold outreach to like famous in Boston CEOs and get, get me to show up at their office and let me interview them. Like <laughs> I had to sell sponsorships. I had to build a MailChimp email list. And like mm. that was when everything changed for me. And like, that's when I learned marketing. Mm. Then I got to match that up with like being at a place like HubSpot and, and, and like learning from Mike Volpe and people there turning that into my job at Drift. And like the, the only secret from Drift was I, I did the marketing, like I wrote every word in, in the beginning and then mm -hmm. scaled as we went. And so like I learned by doing, yeah. and now I'm at a point where I got to take a new job at Pervy and like every day I get so excited because I'm, I'm re realizing subconsciously all these things that I've learned from that journey that I'm now applying. And it's just like the only way to really learn is by doing and mm -hmm. I, I don't wanna stop that. And so I'm always like tinkering, it's why I have, that's why I have this side, this side thing called the A-list, which is my group on Patreon, because like, I think I'm learning things through that group that I'm going to get to take back and use that privy that are going to make us better as a company. Yeah. And I, I just don't ever want to lose that. And like, I think there's an important thing in there, which is like the way, if you really want to learn, start something on the side, mm -hmm. especially today, it's so easy. You could start a TikTok channel, a YouTube channel, you know, let, let's say you're a marketer and you're not crazy like me and you just don't want to talk about marketing. Like my thing is marketing, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you're a marketer, but you love baking. Mm -hmm. What if you, why don't you go start a YouTube channel and learn how to you do YouTube SEO and grow that channel? I'd rather hire that person all day over the person who has some, some like perfect looking degree on paper. And that's really, cause like, that's the story that I lived. I think it's made me well-rounded. I'm not, I'm not super great at any one thing in marketing, but I, I, I know enough about each area to like be able to go and find the right people to work with to get it done. For sure. And you know, that's something that we spoke with uh, Margaret Malloy two weeks ago, and she's the global CMO of Seagull and Gale, like a massive agency up in uh, New York, you know, and she's done exactly the same thing you know like she's gone back to roots she started a new campaign called wearing irish and she said exactly the same thing that you know it gives her the opportunity to kind of engage with the lessons which she wouldn't necessarily be able to uh anyway um i'm, I'm curious and I'll, I'll i'll start taking some community questions in a moment but you, you sort of touched on it in the second there which was about your experience on drift and now how you've gone to privy are you kind of able to see into your marketing future to a certain extent. I mean, obviously there's gonna be like elements which are gonna be changing. I mean, coronavirus for one is like obviously a huge thing, but hopefully when we get back to business as usual, are you able to sort of say, well, we're probably gonna be taking those challenges at this point. And if so, like what are those challenges that you foresee when you're sort of scaling your business? Yeah, I don't know. I, I honestly think this is such a unique time in history that for anybody to give you like a prediction is just complete guess. Mm -hmm. I think right now we're taking it day by day, week right. by week, everything is changing that quickly. Um, I do think though, like 
you know, you're in an industry that's going to be impacted for a while, right? Like, I, I don't, I don't think that it's realistic to assume that inside of six months, at least, we're going to be able to do large gatherings, right? And so like, I think that means events are out the window. Um, and events are such a huge part of business. Like, you know, we at Privy, we, we were just getting ready to announce our first annual event. And, you know, to show you that I love events, right? Like, so, so it's a bummer to miss out on that channel. But I think, you know, the, the, the challenge to marketing is going to be like, how can you re try to recreate those experiences online and do it in a world where everybody else is going to be trying to do this, the, the same thing. So like, how, how are you going to be able to stand out? That's kind of one theme is like, what are you going to do to replace events? Um, I think the other theme that's going to bubble up is just empathy, right? And I think empathy is always the most important topic in marketing because if you can't understand who you're trying to sell to and communicate with, like you're not going to be very good at that. But I think, you know, in a world where everyone is going to know somebody that was like impacted by coronavirus, mm -hmm. um, how, how do you have a message that that's going to be effective, but also not come across as pushy as insensitive as tone deaf and so like you know you still have a job to do you still have to go and try to build a business and sell stuff like please keep your foot on the gas there mm -hmm. but how do you do it in a way that's gonna you know match what what people really are ready to do in, in their life and um i think that's just a unique problem that each brand is going to have to figure out on their own for sure I, I can certainly sort of speak to that myself that even if we had a, a quote unquote perfect match on, you know, someone who would be a perfect marketing meter pretendee back in the day. Uh, one of my main challenges right now is that even if they were right on every demographic, on every previous behavior, they're probably going to be reacting to things quite differently at the moment. You know, they're going to be in different head spaces. So it's a real challenge and something I'm very mindful of, but don't have the answers to in terms of how can we uh, make sure that our communication uh, is and copywriting is on point for as many people as possible who fit our demographic you know and, and that's a challenge and I don't know I don't think it's one that anyone has necessarily yeah. solved I, I still think though like this is something I've been thinking about a lot in the last week or so I think that this is like this is the new this is reality now this is the new world that we live in and so like my initial take was I, when when the coronavirus stuff really peaked in in the states here um we kind of hit pause on marketing for a couple of days right. just to like not promote stuff for a couple of days to see what what shake what what kind of shook out of that but now it's become obviously like this is this is not this is going to be we're going to be dealing with this for six months 12 months 18 months two years so my concern is from a marketing and business perspective is that like you you can't be afraid you still have to take risks and so you still have to like you can't be afraid of, you can't let that fear of, you know, saying the wrong thing at the wrong time limit you from trying to come up with that next crazy creative idea. It doesn't mean like, you, there's never a good time to be tone deaf, but I think like you still have to find ways to be creative, um, especially now more than ever to go and like earn people's attention. Definitely. No, I'm so with you, you know, it is right. It's, um, you know, it starts with empathy and it starts with good intentions. And I guess, you know, after that point, you know, you start pushing those those barriers and trying to help folks in so many different ways. Um, right, so I'm going to take some questions from the audience here. Um, one thing I'd say is that there's a Q&A down below uh, for those of you who haven't found it so far, and also to use the thumbs up mechanism um, because then we'll just start listing from the top uh, the ones, the questions that we want answering. Uh, so there's a question from my mate Baz here, uh, which says there's a trend around articles and blogs focusing on the new normal when lockdowns are finally over. What do you think the nor new normal for marketers will look like if it will even exist? And potentially you might not be able to answer this because you've always said predictions will be very hard. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think we just touched on that. Like the, the, the new normal is going to look like e-commerce. I mean, I'm, I'm feeling thankful to be in e-commerce right now. Like I think the new, the new normal is going to be much more spend is going to happen online. Um, I think it's, it's so tough to answer because every, every industry is different right now. Like some industries are scaling up budgets right now. Some people are cutting back and doing layoffs. So I don't know, not to, not to cop out on an answer, but no. I don't know what the new normal is. I'd be lying if I, if I had an answer. No, I, I think you'd be also on 
a lot of money, <laughs> maybe even more than now. Uh, so Alice Colley says, what do you think as CMO or marketing director's biggest challenges right now? Probably team. Um, you know, if, you, if you're, I'm, I'm assuming you're asking at like the CMO level or somebody who's running a marketing team, I think just like overall, you know, how are the people on your team doing? Because I think, you know, there's a lot going on and you're not there to like actually see everybody in person. So team is probably number one on the marketing tactics side. I think it's just like, how do you keep, how do you keep the urgency on from a, from a sales perspective, you know, in a world where like you, you can't really push right now. Mm -hmm. Nice. So um, I'd be interested. This is a question that I took from uh, our mutual friend, Richard Wood uh, from six and flow. Um, so I've been doing a podcast. Has this question, has this question been vetted already? <laughs> I mean, I've taken the swear words out if that counts. <laughs> okay. Okay. So he says, uh, what's your biggest weakness as a marketer and how have you mitigated that with your current team? That's a great question. Um, my biggest weakness as a marketer is probably, um, I'm really good at starting things and then. Uh, there's usually one or two things that I fall in love with. Um, you know, I'll be the first one to be like, Oh, let's go look at the conversion rate of that. Like one, you know, campaign. Yeah. But then like, I have no interest in actually like doing that and going into Salesforce and running the reports. And, you know, I I'm not going to be the analytical, like slice and dice chopper of campaigns and like, Oh, if we put this here, we're going to double the conversion rate and we can move this around and we're going to move this budget over here. Like, um, and so, so the way that I've, uh, supplemented that is, um, hired somebody amazing to, to own that and, and trust them to be great at it. And it's, it's really been amazing. It's really been amazing to have, um, his name is Ryan and to, to be able to have somebody who's, who's great at that and, and do it because it just gives me, you know, selfishly the freedom to like double down on my superpower, right. Which is like the brand and the creative and copy, like, and I don't have to think about where I'm going to spend my time. And I think my, my experience probably five years ago would be like threatened by that. Like, Oh, I need to know more than that person. If I'm going to manage them, I need to be smarter. I need to like know all the things inside and out. And, and the answer it's I, I did an interview last year with, with um, Heather Zinzak and it was for drift and, 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 her, she's good friends with the CMO of LinkedIn. And um, somehow we were talking about career paths as a CMO. And, and I asked her because I read a book about the CMO of LinkedIn, um, where she talks about how she came from a PR background. And I was like, whoa, that's super interesting to see like a big name CMO who came from PR. And, and, and I, in that interview, I talked to Heather about it. And she said, look, you can be a CMO from any background. You just have to have that core discipline and be able to then like hire around the areas and, and build a team around. And so she said like in that area where she is, her background is, is PR at, at LinkedIn and she's got to like, she's obviously going to spend like more time there because that's what she's naturally good at. And she can focus She has to hire someone very good, better than her who knows the demand gen, who knows the funnel. Right. And so like, for me, that was priority number one in, in joining this company is like, all right, thing that I want to do right away. I know my first hire, I wanted to be somebody who is super analytical, you know, the yin to my yang and can run that part of the team and, and we can have a, a great relationship. And that, that, that's been an amazing um, learning for, for me this time. And I think that just comes with knowing what, what is, what is your weakness and how are you going to plug that gap? For sure. So you had a really strong relationship with uh, David Cancel, and you know I'm sure I probably still do. Was he as a mentor? Was he similar to you in in the sense that he was a very creative chap, or was he the yin to yang in in terms of being very data driven and and that kind of stuff? He's su he's super creative. I mean, w the most fun that I had in my career was just like riffing him and I would always just be riffing back and forth on on ideas whether that's a headline or a hook or a video or a podcast idea uh, I think a lot of people don't know how creative he he is with that type of stuff and that was really cool for me because like I thought before oh somebody just writes a headline and it's done and like what he taught me was like he would just be just he wanted me to reach out to him when I was stuck on something and so then we just kind of riff on something and I can't tell you how many 
how many good ideas or, or headlines or, or intros or phrases came from like a back and forth text at like, you know, nine o'clock on a Tuesday night. Um, and so I got a lot of like, I learned a lot about creativity from, from him and, and how to go. And I also learned from him, like how to go be inspired and get, um, and get ideas. Like I, I wasn't, I never thought of myself as that creative before, but I realized that that is my strength now because I learned from him, like how to go do that. And that's like studying, you know, studying other, you know, related topics and seeing how they do it. Hey, how does somebody else do it in this under other industry? Like, wow, did you know Porsche is like amazing at copywriting and advertising? Like if we're going to sell something high end, like go and study the lessons from Porsche. And so like, I learned that, that framework um, to help me be creative. And that that's been a huge thing for me. So that's awesome. And um, that's really interesting. And um, like the relationship between the two of you, like in many ways, I sort of saw you and uh, the other Dave, you know, as like the faces of the company. And of course, that couldn't have been very easy, like first and foremost, like leaving Drift in the first place. Um, but I wondered if there's any sort of lessons that you have for companies who are building brands around specific faces and specific people. Um, because no doubt that, you know, even in my introduction, I mentioned, mentioned drift and you're not there anymore, you know, and, but you've still taken this personal brand and you're now applying it to privy. Will you do the same again in putting yourself first and foremost, or are you quite likely to sort of take a step back and, and make the brand sort of speak a little bit more? Yeah, I think, I think here it, it's, di it's different for different stages of the company. And so like joining privy, they were already around, 10 million in, in revenue. They had 60, 65 people at the company, 400,000 like merchants using that. And so like it, the challenge wasn't necessarily to come in and like find people who are interested in buying. It was, it was more like, you know, elevate the brand. And so what I'm doing in this role is trying to make Ben, who's the CEO, like he should be the, he should be the face. He should be the spokesperson but I'm going to like, you know, marketing is my thing and I can go into e-commerce and talk about marketing. So I'm going to host the e-commerce marketing show, but I'm not the expert. I'm interviewing experts and like playing dumb, like, Hey, I don't know anything about e-commerce teach me. And so, um, I think we're kind of using a little bit of like a hybrid approach this time. Mm -hmm. I do think though, that to me, this is like, I can't think of a reason why you wouldn't want to do this because ultimately people buy from people and we're all looking for that. Like, we're all looking for that person who we can see and, and interact with and, and, and like actually communicate with as a person, not as a brand. And I think like for a lot of, especially in the B2B space or, or any brand, really most products that you're selling are commodities today. And so the way to win customers is to build relationships with people. And I think you're just going to, you're able to stack the deck if you can do that for your company. So like, I, I can't think of a reason why I would not want to be the face of, of anything. Um, I just think it just like depends on what your expertise is. So like if I, if I went to a cybersecurity company, I, I my whole shtick is not going to work in that industry. And so like, I can't be the face of cybersecurity, but I would shift my focus to then be like, Oh, how do I make this CEO? Like, why did she start this company? Like what, what what's her story? Like, she, okay, I'm going to make her the face of this. And I'd, you know, launch a podcast for her and write a book for her. And I think that that playbook recipe formula, whatever you want to call it is something that I would apply to any company. So it's not, it's not about me and putting myself as the face of it. It's about who are the experts in your company and how can you make them the face of it versus just your logo? Sure. And although I, I would sort of add to that, that, one of the things that's been quite interesting to sort of see you do since December is that you've been posting on LinkedIn quite a bit about um, how you use the, the podcast as an opportunity to learn and learn from the best. So as much as you're sort of saying that um, you, you place your experts for first and foremost, there's also something in the, in the process that's quite captivating to kind of watch from the outside in, you know, someone getting better at something, learning something new. That's pretty cool. So I like that as a tactic. I think it's, it's good. Uh, we've got a question here from uh, Marie Helen, uh, who says, and it's a very big question, which is, do you pay more attention to your gut feelings or to stats slash numbers? Um, I don't think you can pick one. I think it's a, it's a blend of both. You know, it's like, 
which one of your kids do you love the most? Like you, you got, you got to be able to, you got to be able to use them both. I think um, gut is usually the thing that gets me the most excited. And then I go and and, and look at something like, I got a crazy idea. Let me go call up Ryan and see if he can actually go like, you know, give me some, give me some gut check on this. Like, Hey, what if we did this in this segment? Would this be interesting? Uh, that actually doesn't make any sense. Okay, cool. Like you, you gotta be able to use them both together. Um, but there's definitely times where it depends on what the thing is, where, where, where your gut might tell you to do it. Like when we were going to do our event, the, the ROI math that we could come up with for like how much revenue would be able to generate from that was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> but the gut feel the gut feeling is like, oh, we're not doing this event to generate revenue. We're doing it to generate content and brand. And so my gut feeling is that even though this is going to be a big expense, it's going to be worth it. And it's not going to be something that people are going to be able to articulate why it was worth it until after we do it. And then everyone's going to go, ah, no one's looking for the <laughs> ROI analysis. So so in situations like that, then I use gut, but usually it's like a combination of gut and data. Uh, and how do you handle that conversation? Because, you know, there's MDs and CEOs around the world who you know, they're putting a lot of faith into you, right? You know, to sort of say, you know, you'll be able to see afterwards. You'll be able to attribute it afterwards. Yeah, I, I think you have to have an upfront conversation. Like, I think a lot of, you know, you have to, to me, it's like, what's the goal of doing an event first? Because yeah. I think people have missed, people don't have the right expectations. And so if you're doing an event and then you got to go and, and your your CFO thinks it's a sales event, and then you got to show at the you know end of two months later how there's no revenue from that. Then your CFO is going to be like, "What?" But if you can go in and you can say, "Hey, look, here's the deal. We want to spend this. We want to spend this much budget, and we want to achieve this. Here's what we think we're going to get from it. We think it's going to be a great opportunity to make our best customers love us more. We think we can get three months of content worth it out of it. We think we can great, great, great new photos for our website. And so I think, yeah, yeah, it's going to be a loss for us, but here's why we think it's an investment. Mm -hmm. Can't you see how that's going to be a different conversation with the CFO upfront versus like, well, we're doing an event and it lost money. I think you have to like have that expectation up front. And I always try to like pitch, pitch, like, it's almost like I have to come up with a brief for the CFO or CEO or whoever about why we're doing something. And I think a lot of marketers make the mistake of like assuming that everybody else knows why. They, they, they know why. No, you, your job has to, has to, you have to market internally also. Mm -hmm. I have to market to the CEO every day. I have to market to the CFO every day and ex explain why. And once you can effectively do that a year from now, two years from now, whenever, then you don't have to have those conversations anymore. For sure. I, you know, and I think that's entirely reasonable. It works out really well. So um, there's a question here, which was sent ahead by Sarah. She says, for marketing generalists currently out of work who want to spend some time upskilling, uh, what areas would you, you suggest that they focus on and why? I think that's got to be personal to you, right? Like what I would try to find is sit down and write out like what, what are your true strengths? Is it video production, copywriting, you know, spreadsheets, analytical marketing, demand gen content. And I would use this as an opportunity to get great at something that you're good at, not go learn a new skill, but like, let's say you're pretty good at your okay copywriter. What if you can use the next three months to become a great copywriter? Cause I think that that's where the leverage is, is like, if you're a good copywriter, don't go become like an expert in, in, you know, retargeting and, and spend, you know, six weeks learning courses about, about ads. Like, become a great copywriter to the point where like you are an in-demand copywriter that people want. So that's number one from which skill to focus on. I would do that analysis for yourself. Then number two is then I would go try to find a way to apply that skill. And so like, let's say if it's copywriting, can you go start a newsletter right now? Even if seven people subscribe and it's all of your aunts and uncles, that's fine. The goal is like for you to write every day, every week and like just build up that muscle start a podcast that nobody's going to listen to and that's fine. Start a vlog that no one's listening to and that's fine. But like, I just hate the excuse that like, well, I don't have anywhere to go do that. Like if you want to become a better copywriter, like open up a Google doc and write 500 words a day and you don't have to show that to anybody. But if you do that for three months, think about how much better a copywriter you're going to be. 100%. Sweet. Okay. There's a whole bunch of questions and we're going to get close to time. So this can be considered quite a, a quick fire round, Dave. And, uh, <laughs> that might appeal to the, the Bostonian in you as well. Okay. okay. <laughs> so uh, we're getting a ton of questions here on um, books, 
blogs, courses, podcasts, influencers. So I'm just going to put that to you first. Books, top three books, if you had a gun to your head. 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing, number one. Mm-hmm. Ogilvy on Advertising, number two. And Behind the Cloud, the story about Salesforce, number three. Those will give you your most round, well-rounded marketing MBA in three books. Amazing. Blogs, if any? I don't read any blogs. Privy.com slash blog is the <laughs> blog that I read. Nice. Uh, podcasts. I think I know Joe Rogan's one. Joe Rogan is like my, Lee, my wife, Lee, and I, like it's what we listen to whenever, you know, we just need to just unplug and, and hang out. Um, let me actually, let me, let me pull, let me pull up my podcast right now. Um, I've actually been listening. This is really weird. Usually I don't do this. I've actually been listening to the e-commerce marketing show, our podcast at Privy, because I'm really trying to soak in as much about e-commerce as I can. And so like, it's one thing to just interview you. Um, it's another thing to like, then I have to go listen back to it. And so I've been spending a lot. The other show that I just started listening to is, um, it's called my first million by Sam Parr, uh, from the hustle. Just, I'm interested in, I, I like learning about businesses that are not traditional kind of SaaS businesses. Like I'm interested in like, Oh, this person built $10 million email newsletter business. And that's where you get that from. So. Nice. My uh, right hand man, James has been trying to get me onto that forever. So, uh, <laughs> that might be the push that I need. Um, it's how- too many. There's too many. There is. I mean, if, if a marketer hasn't said, I'm starting a podcast in the last year, are you even a marketer? That's what I want to know. So, uh, um, so you mentioned Gary Vee. Uh, influencers? Um, influencers in what? Influencers in marketing? Yeah, yeah. Let's go for marketing. But most of the audience is marketing based. So. Yeah, Gar- Gary. I mean, I think Gary is amazing. I think a lot of people... I think a lot of people don't like him because of his personality and his bravado. But if you can cut through that, the reason why I I listen to what he says is because he is a guy who through his agency, VaynerMedia is working with the best brands in the world right now. They have, they had the four most popular Super Bowl commercials that they created and produced. And so like, if you're telling me you're too good to listen to that, that person, then, then I have, I have no patience for that. And so like, I think that, if you can deal with the personality and get, and get through that and actually listen to lessons, I think there's, there's a lot, um, in there. Um, obviously I love Seth Godin, uh, as a, as a more classic, you know, you need, you need the balance of those two. I think you need one on each shoulder. (laughs) Could you imagine them in a room together? That would be uh, an interesting. No, (laughs) I can't. I, I, I actually, I actually, though, I, I learned the most about marketing from, from, from like people who are not named influencers, like yeah. um, people who have grown a newsletter. YouTube is an amazing, amazing way to do this. And like, you know, um, my, my, my wife, she, she watches like, uh, there's a bunch of like either food blogs or there's one like um, that's more of like makeup and hair products. And these, these people have 2 million subscribers on YouTube. And I'm more fascinated by like, how did she figure that out? How, how did she crack that audience? And like, what, what techniques do they use? Wow, that's such a good idea. They invited five people to this mm-hmm. private villa and they did this thing. Like, I learned so much more from that than like, oh, I study, you know, Jane Smith, the marketing guru <laughs> from p <P&G. laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so we're still quick fire here. Uh, what's the next big thing you want technology to enable you to do as a marketer? And that's from Jeff man what's it to just manage my whole budget nice (laughs) yeah that'd be quite nice that would be nice okay like there's but there's the budget software but i just want to like just input it just track it every track it all yeah spit it out that would be really nice i'm rubbish at that part i'm rubbish too uh so um question from oliver uh what's your opinion on humor in emails e.g. gifs funny headings emojis um that kind of stuff yeah humor humor is great the problem with humor is that like you just don't always know if it's funny like it might be funny to you and so maybe that could be your that, that the issue that could be the issue but i think to me the rule for writing is like if, if you'd use it in real life use it in business and so like <laughs> you know, think about how ridiculous that question would be like, Hey, Joe, what do you, what, what do you, th- what would you think if I sent you a funny email? <laughs> You'd be like, 
Yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so I think like, I think you have to, you have to, you have to use it um, and, and let the responses be the judge. I think more, more personality in email is always way better. Awesome. A uh, question from O here, uh, which says about uh, copyright, and I've now lost it, uh, but basically he was looking for the hints and tips or even just thought process behind writing the first line of your copy. And, and then I've seen that previously you've always argued that the, the job of the first line is to get people to read the second and so on and so forth. Um, but what's the tip for that first line? The, the the first line for me is is often not even like a line. It's usually like a word. And I start a lot of things like let's say Joe and I are going to host a um, an event next week, and I got to send out an email that's going to invite people to that. Most people would be like, join me next Thursday, uh, April 29th for a you know exclusive webinar invite with Joe Glover, right? Where like the way that I would start that email is, okay, return. So I was thinking that recently I haven't had anyone on who's really great at talking about events. So I thought, who do I know in my network that's great at events? Oh, my friend Joe. Joe's run hundreds of meetups over the last two years. And so I call, I'm going to call him up on Zoom and he's going to join me next week. That's how I'd write that email. Like, and just by saying like, okay, that was a thing that cut through the clutter of that email and got me started. And so like, it's always like the first line for me is usually some type of story or hook or like, so okay, hey, like really quick ways to just hop right into a conversation. Nice. And that goes back to your, uh, the point about natural language as well, you know, just sort of writing as you speak, which is so important. And particularly going back to your uh, key tenant of authenticity, uh, also something that sort of feels more authentic if you're speaking as you write. Uh, there's a conversation, a uh, question here from Remy. Um, I'm going to summarize it because it's long, uh, but this question says uh, you literally wrote the book on conversational marketing. Um, besides writing the book, uh, where in practice do you get started? Besides, write, besides reading the book? Yeah. Besides, where do you get started? I mean, I can say to Remy. Yeah. I think, I think the, the, the place to get started is to think about, is to do an audit of your website and think about like, what's a place that is, what's a place that'd be really easy to replace that or test that new functionality today. So like, let's say you have, let's say you're a marketing consultant and you have a client serve, you have a client business and, and, and you have a button that says like, you know, contact us or request a quote. That's already like a high intent page where somebody's going to give you their information. Like that's where I would think about starting and, and, and testing my first like bot um, would, would be with something like that. So, so, think of really easy things that already exist where you could see a clear lift. The biggest mistake people make is that they try to, you know, Oh, I wish I had a bot on my pricing page that like could, could do these 15 things. And you ask them, they're like, well, well, what does that today? And they're like, nothing. And it's like, okay, cool. Like we can get there, but I want to start first in a place that's really comfortable. Nice. Sweet. Um, so you, you spoke about empathy and the focus on, on customers. Um, Obviously, that's something that's really important to you. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I think a lot of marketers get stuck in the tactics. How do you keep yourself and the team focused on your customers? And that's from Jeff. Yes. So, so a couple of things is number one thing that we did is we actually had everybody on the team um, set up a Shopify business and like go install Privy and create an actual e-commerce site to go through and do that. That that can that can be done all the time. The other one is, um, I think we use a we use a product called Gong, G O N G, uh, and it's it's basically like um, call recording for all sales calls and customer success calls. But you can like, you know, hop to certain points in calls. And I don't know, Udi, Udi who's a CMO from Gong, would kill me if I described Gong as that. But <laughs> it's amazing. And so like, what it's meant is like, I don't have to bother the sales team and say like, Hey, let me know when I can come on a call. Cause like also nobody wants to have the CMO on a call with them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I can just go into gong and listen to calls a lot, which makes it really easy. Um, and I think we just, we just have like a natural curiosity in, uh, in e-commerce and like how our customers are using our product. And so we have this, every Friday we have show and tell inside of the company and, and people are always sharing customer stories or examples. There's a channel in Slack with examples. I think just part of the DNA of the, of the company, honestly, at the end of the day. 
Nice, sweet. Last two, I promise. And these are fun ones. Uh, the first one is uh, it's from Steve, actually. He asked it 50 minutes ago. So he's been waiting patiently on, on, on the Q&A, which is, uh, does music support your creativity? And if so, what are you listening to? <laughs> does music support my creativity? Um, it, it does. It, it's usually just like music usually just boosts the mood that I'm, that I'm already in. I don't need to go listen to music to get a creative. I usually, for me, it's like I, if I just go for a quick walk or work out, I can get something quickly. Um, let me, let me, let me give you an, an, an honest answer of like the very <laughs> last thing, the very last thing, the very last song that I listened to was the Beatles come oh. together, which was only cause um, I was playing it during my kids uh, bath last night. That's awesome. <laughs> That's really, so, you know, we speak about the, the DG a list, but you know, we've got the DG playlist, which I think could, uh, Ooh, could I like that. Thing. Maybe I could, uh, maybe I'll monetize that. But put it in the Patreon, put it in the Patreon. <laughs> um, last one. I know you're a sneaker head. Um, so best, uh, sneakers of all time. Oh my God. My sneakers don't even remember who I am. I saw a meme that was all oh, my shoes ever remember who I am. And I have this closet of good sneakers that I haven't wore. Um, my favorite best of all time. Like it's tough to, I can't say best of all time and not own it because that's like a fraud. Oh, the best is no, you got to own it. So yeah. my, my favorite all time is, is a Jordan one. I think it just goes with everything. I think even if you're like, if you're like, oh, I'm not sure, do I going to look funny in, in Jordan's? Like Jordan 1 is a perfect start for everybody. Nice. And on that note, <laughs> and on sure. that note, we can say, and O has gone mental uh, on, the, on, the, on the chat bot saying, <laughs> 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 with all the emojis. Um, so on that note. I know it's the right answer. Oh, 100%, 100%. So um, DJ, you know, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, for speaking with us there are some questions which have um, remained uh, unanswered so I'd encourage people to find you on Twitter um, yeah do, do that I'm, I'm around this afternoon so just tweet tweet at Dave Gerhardt your questions and I'll, I'll try to go and answer them legend thank you so much and you know I appreciate your time I know you're a busy man so uh, I'm grateful for it and um, good to see you well and good to hear the family well and, and all that sort of stuff so uh, you too, Joe. Thanks for, thanks for thinking of me. And I'm glad that you're figuring out a new strategy for this new world. And I'm, I'll, I'll keep watching what you do. So. Well, thanks very much, man. And uh, thank you to everyone that took the time to attend tonight as well. Um, the recording will be available um, on the Marketing Meet website. Um, it will also be available on the Marketing Meet podcast. Um, please do thank the sponsors, all of whom have been incredible um, in supporting us throughout the course of all this and, you know, for the rest of the time. Thank you all and uh, stay safe and uh, I'll see you soon. Cheers. Take care, everyone.